Three Analogies for the Christian Life 1 Peter 2 1 through 10 Peter's Epistles number 33 by Dr. Robert D. Luganbill Introduction Having in the first chapter sufficiently explained and explored our status as believers who are reborn through faith in the gospel, the word of God, and having established there the principle that this blessed status mandates that we advance spiritually in the same way as we have believed, and that we add to our positional sanctification a holy manner of life. Peter goes on in this first part of chapter 2 to teach us about the processes of spiritual growth, spiritual progress, and spiritual service using three analogies. Having first reminded us of the need for sanctified behavior in order to make any progress in the Christian life, 1 Peter 2.1, Peter explains the process of spiritual growth through the analogy of a growing child, 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, the process of spiritual progress through the analogy of the construction of a building, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8, and the process of spiritual ministry by comparing it to that of the Levitical priesthood, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Careful attention to the details of what Peter says here will give us some very valuable insights into the essentials of how every Christian should live after salvation. Therefore, that is, since the Word of God is the basis for all good things, having put aside all badness and all deception and hypocritical behavior and envying and all bad-mouthing like newborn babes, desire the milk of the Word which is without deceit, that by it you may grow in regard to your salvation, since after all you have tasted that the Lord is excellent. It is Jesus to whom you have come, a living stone, rejected by men, but, in the eyes of God the Father, elect and highly honored. And you yourselves too are being built up, that is, by the Holy Spirit, into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood for the offering of spiritual sacrifices well-pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. That is why it says in Scripture, Behold, I am placing a stone in Zion, a cornerstone which is select and costly, and the one who believes in him will most definitely not be put to shame. This honor belongs to you who are believers, but to unbelievers, Scripture says, this very stone which the builders rejected has become the chief foundation, and a stone for stumbling and a rock for tripping, against which the disobedient collide as they have been appointed to do, that is, because of their decision to reject Christ. But you are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people to be preserved in order that you might proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but who now are the people of God, who now are the people of God, who now have been granted his mercy. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 10. Experiential Sanctification. Chapter 2 begins with a reprise of the principle of experiential sanctification which Peter had covered extensively, and which we have studied, in chapter 1. The summary is detailed, but as in other such lists of bad behavior to be avoided by Christians, for example Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 to 21, not meant to be understood as all-inclusive. In other words, while not content to remind us that we are by position in Christ holy people, and that means that we certainly ought to do our best to live in a holy way more and more day by day, Peter feels the need, under the guidance of the Spirit, to include some specifics here lest we assume that we have already achieved a perfect Christian walk. Peter does this not to discourage us. We know very well that we are forgiven for all our errors and sins whenever we confess them to the Lord, 1 John 1, 9, and can be confident that if we are doing a good job of keeping sin, especially gross sin, under control we need not agonize overly about the issue, but to remind us of the deceptive nature of sin with its wide-ranging and all-pervasive influence. That is, we are not perfect after salvation. 1 Kings 8.46 and 1 John 1, 8 through 10 Peter does this, in other words, to help us stay humble on the subject, even though we may be doing well in our personal efforts to lead a holy, sanctified life that is honoring to Jesus Christ. Having put aside 1 Peter 2.1 it is also worth noting that this revisiting of the principle of sanctification, putting the matter in practical terms by giving us examples of what not to do, precedes Peter's discussion of what is necessary for proactive spiritual growth. 
demonstrating the principle we have often intoned that a good defense and a sustained offense go hand in hand with deficiency in either area affecting the other in a negative way. To get the most out of the Christian life and to honor our Lord to the best of our ability, we need not only to behave in a holy way or only to grow, progress and produce in a positive way, we need to do both because the approach of either one without the other will not take us very far and will turn out to be counterproductive in the end. This is all illustrated by Peter's use of the participle here, apothemonoi, which we are translating as having put aside. It should be noted that this represents deliberate action on the believer's part. It is neither accidental nor automatic. Furthermore, putting off the unseemly activities Peter goes on to list here, along with all other inappropriate behavior, in itself requires a significant degree of spiritual growth. To be effective at resisting sin of any kind, we need to know in some detail what sin is. For as this list shows, while most gross sins are very obvious, there is much in the area of what we think and say, for example, which is also sinful. To carry out Peter's command given in the Spirit, we also need to know something about how we are constructed, spirit and body, about the sin nature, about the spiritual warfare in which we are engaged, about how to recover from sin when we do fail, and indeed about every other possible aspect of the truth of the Word of God, because success in resisting sin cannot really be divorced from seeing things, all things, from God's perfect point of view. For it is when we get knocked off that high ground of correct divine viewpoint that we are more likely to fall back into worldly ways of thinking, speaking, and acting. Do not be a lover of this world, nor of what is in this world. If anyone is a lover of this world, a genuine love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world and its lust are passing away, but whoever does God's will is going to stay alive with God forever. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 through 17 Badness of every sort 1 Peter 2 1. Badness of every sort. Evil is a poor translation for the Greek word kakia in verse 1 because it is a somewhat loaded term in English. Wherever one finds the word evil in the Old Testament, for example, it is almost always rendering the Hebrew word bad as opposed to good, and while there is a separate Greek word for evil, poneria, it too means bad at its core without necessarily embracing all the specialized connotations of our English word evil. Using malice to render kakia is technically correct, but this word today in contemporary English is not well understood and may seem to connote more of a negative mental disposition, whereas the Greek word we have here encompasses anything thought, said or done which is bad or sinful. Wickedness is also potentially misleading because even the worst of sinners may not consider themselves wicked, which has become the stuff of fairy tales or dark satanic evil, and kakia is not so specialized a word. Sinfulness is possibly the closest English word other than badness, but Peter does not use a Greek word related to the morpheme for sin, hamart, which he easily could have done. He no doubt chose to avoid that, because otherwise this mandate would seem to be and would be entirely impossible, since we all stumble from time to time, so that not even the most advanced Christian will ever be without sin, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20 and 1 John chapter 1 verse 6 through 10. So while badness is not the most poetic of terms, it communicates what is meant here, any sort of thought, word or deed which is unbecoming for a Christian. By using the phrase all badness, Peter also keeps things general enough for us to understand that sanctification should encompass every aspect of the believer's life. It would have been impossible for him to include every possible sinful behavior, and for that reason, none of the biblical catalogues which list sinful activities are meant to be taken as completely comprehensive, but rather as illustrative of the kind of things we ought to avoid, for example, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, and Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. Everything we think, say and do, after all, what we do is usually predicated by what we say, and this in turn is directed by what we think. Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, 
and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Matthew chapter 15 verse 17 through 20.